joining us this afternoon. We become a pleasure and honor to be here today. We do have a third presenter today as well. His name is uh, Dwight McDonald. He's our student researcher as well, so uh, his bio may not have been included in the original, but certainly he's uh, one of the valued members of our research team. Then the fourth member is Dr. Melita Mungo. She is under the weather today, but she uh, sends her greetings and wants to be here as well. Very, very passionate about this uh, subject matter that you hear about today. And so we uh, want to thank Melita also uh, for, for joining us on this project. So as Dr. Uh, Edwards mentioned, the title of our presentation is Lift Every Voice. It's all about student narratives. We have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of research out there in this area, and Dr. Padgett will mention more about this later, but it doesn't really capture the student narrative, their voice, and so that's what this project is all about. So let's get right to it. In today's talk, we will uh, first talk about the project goals and the research uh, objectives, the research questions that we had uh, initially when we first began the, the, uh, the project itself. We'll look at the guiding theory that we're using, and it is called persistence. Uh, different from retention. Uh, also, we'll uh, look primarily at some of the data. It's an online survey that we launched last July. It was up from July to December, and we'll talk about that with some of the, the initial data from that survey. Then we'll also look at uh, what at the heart of the, the project itself, which are the student narratives. And so we'll read a few of those for you today so you can get a, get a sense of what people are saying in the survey uh, responses. Finally, we'll have some time for Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Padgett. Okay. Thanks, Melvin. <coughs> I'm going to try not to cough my way through here. First, I want to just thank everybody that's here. As I look around the room, I see a lot of people that I work with on other committees and you know other areas of the university. And I just think this is what it takes for us to be who we need to be is really making a commitment to work together on this campus. And so when I see people around the table like this. This is what I had always imagined in getting a PhD. This is what I had always imagined university life to be like. This is what I had always imagined it would be like to want to be a college professor as a little girl. Uh, so I thank you for affirming that. Um, I always, we have Dwight with us today. Hey Kevin. Uh, this is a, another student in my department. Um, we have Dwight with us today because one of the things that I have started saying in my classrooms is, I don't know if people watch Grey's Anatomy. Anybody watch Grey's Anatomy in here? Got a couple folks. You know, they're always talking about this is a teaching hospital. And in this particular project, there's four of us, as Melvin mentioned on the project, and we have seen so much growth just in ourselves over the course of uh, our pursuit of this topic. And so Dwight represents why we're doing this. He's an undergraduate student here at Wayne. He's a McNair scholar. And when he first came to me, our mentorship, <laughs> it was not like official. You know, like he came and said, I need a mentor. But it was kind of like, I need a mentor. Um, and so we just kind of start talking with each other. And it just became more organic from there. But how we kind of got on the project was that he was really interested in African American males and their experiences here on this campus. So I definitely wanted to start with saying that. One of the things that we already know is, and thanks for coming, Marquita. It's so many of you that y'all just right here. <laughs> uh, we already know that despite institutional efforts to respond to uh, retention issues, that retention is stagnant across the nation at many universities. And this is particularly the case for underrepresented populations. And that's kind of how a lot of this started for us. Uh, it is not unknown that this is an issue also here on this campus at Wayne State. So in the beginning of us kind of thinking about this, we needed to start at home. Before we could theorize elsewhere, we needed to start here at Wayne State. And so we kind of took on this this project, we took on this, uh, made a commitment to really begin to look at retention in a different way here at Wayne. I should also say that, you know, I guess kind of our perspectives speak to how we approach the work. And so in my work, my background is intercultural communication. Uh, I do a lot of critical scholarship in my writing. Same thing with Monita. You know, she kind of approaches things from a, things from a more critical perspective. And so when we started looking at this, we weren't interested in just reading and regurgitating. We were very much interested in reading and questioning, in reading and thinking about, 
okay, since we have so much of this out there, why is it not working? So we need to kind of go inside of the dilemma. And so that is kind of, in essence, our approach, going inside. Uh, there are multiple ways that researchers treat this issue, that they speak to this issue. And a lot of the work centers on uh, retention studies and even looking at persistence. And when we look at retention, I just wanted to kind of start with that. Retention is looked at as a calculation of the percentage of students who return to the same institution year after year. Retention. We could have started there. Well, we kind of did, and we could have stayed there. But when we started, we just closed our study in December. And we started coding data and looking at some of our snapshot data, some of the initial findings and impressions from the data. One of the questions that we started with, uh, and I should say too that the populations that we looked at, I don't know, now I'm off of this, but the pop you can see our research questions. The populations that we looked at, uh, first generation college students, we looked at uh, FIDIAX, first time ever in any college, uh, we looked at LGBTQ, we looked at racial and ethnic minorities and students with disabilities. Those were the five populations that we said, okay, maybe we can start with these populations and really begin to capture the narratives. The thing that surprised me was we didn't really on this campus know how these students felt. We didn't really have, you know, we couldn't wrap our heads around what the challenges were because we didn't really know what the challenges were. You know, I think that we have some statistical data that points us in some directions, but when I asked the question, had we asked, the answer was, surprisingly to me, no, that we had not. So we said, we're going to ask. And one of the first questions that we used was, based on the group that you identified with, what are your biggest challenges here at Wayne? Eight and a half single-spaced pages of printed out content from the students who responded to our study. And we're going to get to, uh, Melvin is going to kind of give you the demographic <coughs> data for the study. And so I guess my job here is to go through the overview. So passion is starting to take over for me now. <laughs> okay, so somebody right. click this and then we move on. I had started saying before that we could have stayed at retention and just looked at this from a retention standpoint. But we used a more grounded theory approach and kind of went inside to look out. You know, and so starting inside with the population, we felt like maybe if we started with the data, we could see where the data was pushing us in terms of theory. And when we started looking at that, the thing that resonated or that began to resonate with us is persistence. And, you know, there's a lot of people, Tinto's work is probably the work that a lot of people are familiar with when we talk about persistence. And we're even pushing at that because, you know, as we look at Tinto's work, uh, dating back from the 1970s, uh, which has captured a lot of his seminal work. He kind of breaks down the framework in different areas. So we have listed some of that on here, looking at students' family background, looking at the students themselves, what are their goals and aspirations, their institutional experiences, and I'm kind of stuck on that because I don't think we need to move forward until we really have a better understanding of what are their institutional experiences. And then the one that we're really beginning to, you know, treat as we go back to, if you look at our research questions, uh, in terms of the impediments for students. When we looked at the literature, there were kind of like these camps, you know, bodies where some were saying that the greatest impediment is internal, that it's within the institution. And then there was a whole other group of scholars who were saying that, no, you know, their greatest impediment is external. It's their home environment, it's their family environment, it's, you know, the lack of support that when they step foot in the institution, they don't really know how to navigate. One of the things that we found was that, yeah, in fact, when the student steps foot in the institution, many of them don't know how to navigate, but that there are impediments in both places. So we can't answer that question conclusively. Remember, we're at the beginning, but we can't answer that question conclusively about where the greatest impediment is. One of the things that we can say is that overwhelmingly, the students who filled out the survey were first gens. Now, I've been teaching on this campus for over 13 years, and I guess I never would have predicted that. You know, I did not know that 
of all the groups that we had, you know, and I guess it's because that can go across identities. So you can be LGBTQ and first gen. You can be a racial and ethnic minority and first gen. So there's some intersections there. But overwhelmingly, uh, we had a lot of students who were first generation college students. Thanks, Robin. I know you're probably doing that. I don't know who has the clicker, but somebody's making it. <laughs> <laughs> so I just put uh, on here, as we began to kind of even look at Tinto's work, and as we began to go back and systematically track the people who were talking about persistence, the people who were critiquing persistence, uh, we're finding some incongruence with the current model for student success. That a lot of the emphasis is institutional. And so it is about what the university deems as successful for the population. It's about more of a white middle class, traditional understanding of what it means to be a successful student at a four-year institution. So for us, we're kind of saying, maybe we need to go from the inside out and we need to be looking at success. Maybe we need to problematize how we're thinking about student success and ask the students. Because for some students, what I may define conceptually, institutionally as success, may not be the way that they're defining success. When you start reading these narratives, it is heartbreaking, it is wrenching to kind of understand that for one student, success might be, I gotta, I'm gonna complete this semester and then I need to go back out and work so that I can get some more money to come back to school to go through another semester. Success might be that you know, I have a, I'm working with a disability, and if I can have my faculty member, my professor, to better understand, you know, how to get me through these assignments, then that might be success for me. So different ways of looking at student success, and I mean, that's, that's gripping me when I talk about this project. So one of the, uh, we had a guiding concern on here, how do the narratives that we've captured reshape our notions of student success? How does it reshape how we think, you know, as an institution about student success? <clears throat> we can go. Okay, so Melvin, this is you, right? Mm -hmm. So the next question, uh, and the answer to that question is, who took the survey? And so first we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about the actual survey itself, and then give you some of the preliminary data that we uh, crunched recently to tell you, and you know, paint a fortune of who actually took the survey. So the survey actually was quite lengthy. There were 68 questions. This is like kind of the current of That's right? not normal. <laughs> not normal. Started small, but uh, it started out in the communication department there, and then as Dr. Padgett began to, to uh, begin to meet with other colleagues around the university, okay. it became interdisciplinary, and so we, uh, uh, Dr. Monita Mungo from sociology joined us, and that's when it really ballooned, and so we actually ended up with 68 questions. We're trying to just get at some of these questions and very uh, same things that Dr. Padgett just mentioned in terms of what are the impediments or challenges to your success as a student. Here are a couple of questions that we uh, actually had on the survey itself. What challenges do you face as a member of X group, whether that's you know, a, a <coughs> minority, whether that is a you know, person with a disability? What are some of the challenges that you face as a member of that group? Also, how would you describe your experience uh, or interaction with the faculty, the staff, and also your peers at WSU? And so those are separate questions, but I kind of lumped right. them all together, but they were actually separate questions. So we have a lot of uh, data, data uh, to look at and, and actually code for that thematic coding for this particular section. So let's uh, find out now who actually took the survey. Gender-wise, predominantly female, 75%. 25% male, 75% female, then one pan gender. Majors just for all over the place. We had accounting majors, computer science, like sociology, psychology, et cetera. And by the way, I, I failed to mention that uh, the, re the uh, results from the survey actually came from our association with Dr. Freda Bolte over at, at our communication department. We have a communication research group, and that is, is a, just a wonderful um, uh, service for all the research here at the university because you can actually get your results from, you know, you can actually get your population to take your survey right inside the communication research group. So uh, we started the survey, it was launched last July, and it was pretty slow moving initially. But once we got on the communication research pool, that thing took off. And so that's a plug for Dr. Volte and, and the great work he's doing over there as the administrator of the SONA system. In addition to the, uh, the gender, we also looked at specific questions like, do you work? 78% of our respondents say, yes, I do work. Uh, of those, 64% they said they work part-time. The other 36% uh, work full-time, which is 20 hours or more. 
We also asked them did they volunteer in any capacity for, for a community group or a church, et cetera. And 51% said yes, they do volunteer. In terms of, we also want to look at their, their attendance. Were there gaps in your attendance while attending a school here at Wayne State? And uh, many said that uh, they have no gaps in their attendance, 89%, in fact. That they do not have any gaps in attendance that they're going through consistently from semester to semester. Also, uh, here was a telling question. We asked them, were you aware of any support groups in your area? So if you are a person with a disability, are you familiar with other groups on campus that also address <laughs> issues with, with, for those who have disabilities? Only 56%, which is over half, it sounds okay, but only 56% say yes, I'm aware of these other support groups. That number we thought should actually skyrocket, right? It should. Also, the last one is, uh, does cost determine the number of classes you take per semester? And 61% say yes. Keep going here. <coughs> In terms of the, the racial makeup of the survey respondents, here it is. They're mostly Caucasian, 34%, followed closely by African Americans at 33%. That was also followed by the other category, which includes actually biracial uh, students as well as those of Arab descent. That was a, out of a population of 257 respondents for that one. 46% of our respondents enrolled in the last two years, 46%, but 81% enrolled since 2002. So 2012 through 2015, we, we had you know, the bulk of our respondents applying. In, in terms of how they represent themselves, uh, their identities, most uh, were of racial and ethnic backgrounds. 151 respondents uh, say yes, I, I uh, associate with those groups on campus filling this, this area of racial and ethnic groups. First generation, 134 respondents for that one, 52%. FIDIAC, which is first time in any college, 60 of those respondents said they are in that category, 23%, and, and so on. Again, there was some overlap here because I can also be, I can be a this person with a disability and as, as well as a person who's a first generation student as well. So there's some overlap there. In terms of income, the bulk of obviously would be, uh, not obviously, but 19, $20,000 or less. So you have uh, about 80% uh, there, $20,000 $20, or less in terms of student income. One question we had on the survey also, trying to, again, just look at it to see if maybe finances was an issue. Do you contribute to your educational expenses? And according to our survey, 209 respondents say, yes, I do contribute to my books and supplies, which is 82% of our respondents. Tuition-wise, 59% say they contribute to their tuition. Parking, 66%, and so on. Also, do you contribute to your household expenses? What about that one? For food, 62% say, yes, I contribute to my own to, to what I eat. <laughs> also, in terms of my transportation, gas, uh, insurance, also the car note, 53% for that one. So the students are, you know, they're doing both. Here was a really important question for us is, okay, of all the challenges that are out there, and, and we pulled some of these challenges directly from the literature, so our typology came directly from what we were seeing in the literature. Uh, this is how the students rank, rank ordered these. So the, at the top two are both related to finances. So financing, Financing my education or financial issues would be number one, with 94% saying that was the number one challenge that they face here at the university. Number two was their household bills and expenses, that's about 83%. Again, there could be some overlap here because they can, they can vote on more than one category. The relational support, which is relational support in college as well as at home, we have 75% of the respondents saying yes, that's also a challenge. So I might be challenged at home where before I even get to college, as I go through my neighborhoods to get to college, and then once I'm on campus, then I might face some challenges there as well. So those are, again, very, very important. We also asked about their interpersonal reactions or interactions, excuse me, at Wayne State with faculty and also staff. And for, for this one, 67% say they, that they consider that, that a challenge as well. So it ranked as number four of all the challenges that we had. We had 12 challenges listed, so that, that also ranked uh, highly. Also, the interest of ac academic preparation prior to coming to Wayne, um, actually, I think, yeah, 59% for that one. And also, uh, the, uh, two, the next two are sort of related. Identifying a career, vocational goal, and also choosing a major, both of those were considered challenges as well, with a certain percentage uh, identifying those. And now, we actually get to the heart and the core of our research project, which is the narratives. Right. This is where, you know, we really just started reading uh, what the students were saying. Uh, the first set of slides speaks more specifically to just how the students identified themselves. And then the, 
second set of slides talks more about kind of some of the themes that we're seeing across groups. So for these couple, first couple slides, we're looking at first gens and what are they saying. Uh, one student here said being a first gen uh, means that I am unable to turn to family or help with my coursework. Some things are just out of reach of being understood. So at that home life, they don't have that support where people are really understanding what they're going through. And so in this one, as we're beginning to code, you know, we're looking at this as a capacity to be able to support, you know, because it, it speaks more to the capacity that people at home have to be able to support that student who's in college. Being a first-gen student is difficult because a lot of pressure is on me to succeed. I still experience slight biases at Wayne State, but I must accomplish my goal. And that last sentence is something that we are starting to see as well as a theme across the groups, which pushes more to this kind of act of will to be able to you know, proceed through college. Uh, so that's the first gens. This next one, <coughs> uh, being a first time college student is difficult because you simply don't know everything you need to know. So talking about preparation, uh, they talking about their family members don't have any clue how this works. And I really think students in my situation just feel lost in the dark. It's deep, it's telling. Folks like me, and we saw a lot of that too, and so we're gonna have to figure out a way to categorize this kind of internal struggle you know, with identity that students are having. Folks like me feel like we're on the outside looking in uh, even this far along. We don't know how college works because we've never seen it or heard it talked about. So not having you know, people to really exchange with about the college experience. For our LGBT population, you know, this was interesting because in the literature, a lot of the literature makes connections between the LGBTQ population and racial and ethnic minorities. And that for them, one of the biggest issues that they face is a feeling of connectivity and safety on the college campus. And so you even see that in some of the responses. This is one student. We do not often get together at Wayne unless we are inside the buildings for fear of harassment or violence from strangers towards us. So this is, you know, actually an issue of safety on the campus, you know, in terms of harassing behaviors. I have received homophobic and racial backlash from students and faculty since being at Wayne State. We were really, a lot of our work is looking at where students have some of these experiences, these moments that are kind of life-changing or defining for them. And there was a lot of peer-to-peer -peer kind of contact where peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, relational interactions are defining moments for them. But then there's also experiences where it's in the classroom with faculty members. So that's going to be another area that as we pick up, like, what's next, we're going to have to really begin to explore the relationship between faculty and students and really what faculty can do to help students feel more connected to um, the college experience. Students with disabilities, this is Melvin. So rolling, go right in. <laughs> so I was rolling. Here's one poem from a student with a, with a disability. It says, as an individual struggling with social anxiety disorder, these demands, these assignments were too much. For her handle. Uh, the student also said that some professors demonstrate a lack of willingness to understand the real struggles of the student, and which leads to a feelings of shame, isolation, and also dis discouragement. But the Angie just mentioned that it's the issue of a safe space. Right. And so for those with disabilities, coming into class when sometimes, you, especially if you're a wheelchair user, that can be an issue for them immediately. So and let me say something else for this one, because for a lot of our students with disabilities, they were, um, there were a lot of psychological issues. And uh, this population, at least what we're seeing so far, spoke a lot about uh, being deterred or finding impediments in the classroom specifically. And so in their interactions with faculty, there was little to no support for their identity as a disabled individual, which you know, translates into them not being able to complete assignments or not fully <coughs> understanding the expectations. I mean, there were many that, you know, we captured that were very specific, that were very detailed about the level of interactions that are they're finding difficult to navigate in the university. So there's going to be a lot of data from there. The next category was actually racial, racial ethnic minorities. For this one, that's one. Mm -hmm. yep, that's, that's the one. I get to. 
The white has to participate. <laughs> I just want to prove it just by saying um, this right here is the reason why I'm actually involved with the project because my own experience is being a rich minority here at Wayne State. Yeah. Um, once the, I have been the only minority in many of my classes, and people have historically expected me to be rowdy or unable to handle the material. Teachers and other students were shocked that I was intelligent for a minority. When I first got here, it was plenty of people who looked like me in my classes, but as I've gotten older, and particularly through my senior coursework, I realized I'm pretty much one of the few African Americans, mainly African American men. Yeah. I noticed there are a lot more African American women in my courses, but for some reason, the brothers are just aren't really there. Another student wrote, being African American from an urban area with a broken family and no money makes things much worse. There's always a consistent interpersonal struggle with who I am. That also holds true for me because my family isn't really rich. My mother and my grandmother do work hard to provide for me, but I don't have any extra funds available for college. So every I've gotten to this point basically through financial aid and a few scholarships that I was able to give. I'm usually one of the only people of my ethnicity in a classroom, so sometimes that can make decisions difficult because I have to I have a different point of view than others. And although this being a Hispanic, I had a lot of community sense, especially on campus, because there are not many Native Hispanic students. Now, I'm not Hispanic, but I did realize when I first got here, I didn't have that community sense. I didn't actually get that community sense until my sophomore year, where I found a student org called Student Argument Brotherhood. And I can probably say, without a shadow of a doubt, me joining that community is the reason why I'm graduating in May. Because without it, I'm pretty sure I would have made the same mistakes I made my freshman year, which I was pretty ignorant of how college worked. I actually almost flunked out to be honest with you. But now I'm getting rid of graduated, mainly because of the community sense. Let's talk about across groups. And we don't spend a lot of time today talking about next steps because, again, we're just really into uh, the data on this. But one of the things that we're starting to see across the groups is this issue of academic support. Uh, we initially thought, you know, that this would speak to resources and, you know, kind of whether the students were aware was one thing that we were interested in in the resources and whether they accessed the resources that were available. So we are seeing that, you know, there's some specific things with regard to that, but there's a broader area here of academic support. So not just, we see resources now as more of an under the umbrella, but the broad area is uh, academic support. And so some of the things that we've identified just from some of the quotes, you know, study skills, taking too many courses, not having anyone close to me to speak about, you know, some of the stuff that we've already kind of categorized here. Letting students know what a good student is, a good instructor, counselor, advisor relationship looks like. They're hungry to understand <laughs> how to do this better. You know, if someone can please help me understand how I can navigate. And so navigation, you know, is something that we've been talking about in our groups. One of the early things that we did when we started putting this together is we had a, <coughs> we would have labs. And we would just have like a two or three hour block of time. And we would just, today we're going to talk about, you know, theory. Today we're going to talk, and we would do that, you know, and with Dwight there, it was a, just a wonderful organic process. But over the summer, we took one day to just record our own experiences with the university. And so we talked about, you know, it was kind of like our testimony. And, you know, I talked about my testimony, you know, here being an undergraduate student at Wayne, Monita talked about her testimony, Dwight talked about his, Melvin talked about his. It was our testimony. So, you know, as we began to look at some of these, you know, the, the quotes, they resonate with us. And we're struggling against that with what the literature is saying. And so there's a, there's a big push, you know, we want to push beyond what is in the literature. You know, there's something else that can be known about this. And I think the real outcome is going to be for this population, and I don't know yet if we can generalize across populations, but for this population, what are some of the strategies and things that we can do to help students better connect here you know, with Wayne State on this campus, to be more successful here uh, at Wayne State, to understand how they see success here at Wayne State. 
Uh, social support, I told you about this one, that you know, this is an area of struggle because in the literature, there's these you know, two camps where the biggest impediment is internal and the biggest impediment is external, and we are finding much evidence for both. You know, parents not being able to give relevant advice, a lack of knowledge and help from family members you know, uh, that makes things tough. Nobody has an extensive knowledge about college. Family doesn't see the importance of education. There was one particular quote that struck me, and, and Professor Dunbar, it took me back to a comment that you had made a while ago. This particular student said uh, that the family was pressuring them and basically was saying, why are you doing this? You know, why are you incurring this debt? You know, then you need to just drop out and work. And so the family wanted them. They did not see the value in getting an education. They didn't see the value. So, you know, you see now like what some of our coding categories are as we begin to talk through uh, some of the comments. Oh, okay. Inclusive environment and safe space. You know, this is another one. And this was particularly true for our LGBTQ students uh, who identified that there wasn't a community for them, people who are like me, on the campus. And so that was an issue. Financial hardship. Um, you know, I think going into this one, we had some students who spoke about this in the narratives, <coughs> but, you know, I guess I thought that there would be much more evidence, you know, of examples about this notion of financial hardship. You know, every single year has been a challenge at Wayne State in terms of debt or <coughs> balance. And we're, if you read the literature across the board, we already understand that this is across the board. You know, some of these issues are not specific to Wayne State, but it doesn't mean that we don't need to address them. Okay, so a lot of evidence, guys, that impediments to success are both. Uh, there's a lack of capacity at home and then a lack of knowledge about how to navigate through the university. And I'm really stuck on that now, even at the beginning of the project, about how we might begin to strategize to begin to change that. You know, this lack of knowledge about how to navigate. Because we have the capacity here at Wayne to help students understand how to navigate. We have, you know, all these resources here, but there's a disconnect between the resources that we have and how students understand them and access them. That can be fixed. That's not that hard. So we have to figure out a way to begin to connect that. Uh, with you know, respect to the inclusive environment and safe space, I mentioned earlier that we're seeing a lot of connections between the LGBTQ population and racial and ethnic minorities. They spoke the most about this. And I think what's most troubling for somebody like me who was in the classroom is students, any student in my classroom who doesn't feel like they should be there or who doesn't feel like I want them there, you see. So in the examples that I use in the classroom, I'm not gonna represent, you know, I'm only gonna represent a small group of people because everybody else doesn't matter. And I'm not just saying that, when we read the narratives, this is what we're finding. We're finding that students are paying for tuition however they pay for it, sitting in a classroom not feeling like they belong, they should be there, or that people want them sitting in the seats. And I, I can't even imagine that in 2016 at an urban campus. So we have to kind of figure out ways to deal with that. Financial hardship, uh, initially it did look like, you know, there wasn't enough evidence to support that this was a major impediment for us. But what we saw was in the statistical data, very high, ranked very high. But when it came to capturing the narratives, we didn't have as much narrative data to support this. And so it could be that there are just other issues that are more paramount uh, for the students that, you know, or that this is like a foregone conclusion. We don't know the reasons why. But I can tell you that one of the things that's next for us is to begin to take some of the areas that were most significant in this study and do focus groups on campus with students to really kind of tease out and get more specific, not just about mucking up what are the challenges, but about strategies. We've got to figure out a way to begin to build a bridge between, so you know I'm, my head is going faster than I can talk, but to build a bridge between what we're finding and the strategies that are necessary to get us to where we need to be. And I would say too that in that, multiple voices have to be at the table. Because the students identify that they're all over the place. 
they're studying everything all over this campus. And some of them have, you know, multiple majors. They are, um, some are involved in just various things around campus. And so just really no concentrated makeup, you know, of the student. And so we really need to start to kind of tease that out and, and treat that. It has been uh, our pleasure to uh, at least talk about you know, some of the snapshot data that we're finding and we're now opening up to any questions that you might have. We answered everything. <laughs> like all the questions in your head. <laughs> Mom. Um, you mentioned that there are resources available for students that are having, you know, some of these challenges. What are they? Uh, there's everything from uh, student disability services. Uh, we have an advising center. <coughs> we have a counseling center. Um, our uh, president's wife, our first lady of the university, has a program to help homeless students. Uh, we have. Um, federal trio, you know, with a lot of pipeline programs that help students come in uh, to Wayne State and be more successful here that are specifically for uh, racial and ethnic minorities. You know, there's a lot of resources. What we tried to do in the survey uh, with one of the questions, we actually gave, you know, some examples of, you know, some of the resources that the university has and students could, you know, kind of check off what they've accessed here at the university. So I think the answer to your question is, you know, we've got a lot of resources that are available, but again, I would echo, there's a disconnect between <laughs> overall, you know, if I'm a student, you know, an advisor might have a student who is um, homeless in the sense that they're going from place to place, you know, that they just don't have a real address. This week I'm living with my cousin, next week I'm going over my aunt's house, the following week I'm going to go, you know, with one of my friends. So they don't really have a place, and that affects their ability to be successful in college. Uh, in the departments, at that level, we deal with students with all kinds of challenges. And one of the things that we're needing to become more adept at as a faculty and a staff is knowing who to call. It's just knowing who to call. You know, do we call our dean of students, which my department calls our dean of students for a lot of things. But, you know, Ebony is working for the Dean of Students Office, so go ahead, Ebony. Oh, I had a question um, oh, okay. in regards to the, did you all happen to ask in your uh, survey about commuter versus residential students? We did, didn't we? We did, early on, uh, in terms of demographics, we asked. Uh, in the beginning. Where, where, where <coughs> reside, and many people said they stayed within a 30 minute travel time. So we gave them a radius yeah, for that radius. question. In your coding, uh, did you make any attempt to look at some of the differences between the students' issues around university, cons I mean, uh, university concerns or faculty concerns versus the student concerns, such as their perception of the university side versus the student side? Because most of the thing you talked about was had to do with the students and financial and how they felt. Yes. But what would, did you have any questions that asked the students how they felt about the other side? We, the we, faculty side? We did was more or less in the classroom, support from the faculty, uh, those questions were certainly there. We had to actually three categories, family. You haven't analyzed all of those yet? Not yet, no. that's, that's our second half, the second half. Because now what we begin to do now is actually take a look at the populations and then see how the various populations respond to all the different questions. What challenges are most prevalent for those who are African Americans or those who are Latino and so, and so on. So that's the next <coughs> layer that we're going to begin to peel back then. Yeah, but it is primarily, um, if I understand your question, from the student's perspective and how they see you know, the challenges in their connectivity and their accessing of the university experience. Did you ask them if they had the perception that the university cared about them? Or some configuration of that question? I know we didn't use care. Uh, one of the, the words that we used was support, where they draw support, uh, but we did not use the word care. Yeah, that just was prompted by what Dr. Dunbar asked about, you know, how they perceive the institution. 
Yes. You know, or do they feel like they're out there on their own, having to na you know navigate or whatever? Does that include that the institution also is not a source of support or of <coughs> helping them understand what their resources are? Yeah, we are. I can tell you that. And yes, that's consistent with the literature because there is some literature that talks about that as well. And I think we are going to have to treat that because one of the uh, examples that you know I thought of when, when you said that was a student who felt like in some way Wayne saved him. That you know he uh, this was a student, and I only say he because you know he identified that way, but uh, was a veteran. Um, a student with a disability and really didn't start out thinking about I'm going to college but ended up on the campus went to the Welcome Center started talking to people and next thing you know um, felt like my life was changed uh, in some way we have also had evidence that there's some students who have had in their discussion about some of the challenges you, you also can tease out that they've had some positive experiences where they have been able to draw some support from the campus and when we, the first level of coding, we said, let's not touch it. We're not going to touch it. Let's put it in the parking lot. So right now, I can tell you, that's in the parking lot. And uh, when we go back through, we will end up having to deal with that because it's not just one. It's not just one. Yeah. So it really is an interesting question to ask, especially as we kind of connect this back to the work on persistence. Yeah. But I think one of the, the we kind of turn in a different direction when you look at the work on persistence because we're looking at you know underrepresented groups, and so a lot of the criticism is you know we can't have this one size fits all way of theorizing you know that we've got to be able to understand better uh, the <coughs> cultural groups you know that we're looking at. So at least for this first step, that's what we're trying to do. Going back to the, the low level, only 55% of awareness of resources. You mentioned that as you brought it up. And it's from a sample size that's already responded to a very long survey and shown very high interest in their success with 92% about wanting to be successful. Was in the questions about awareness of resources, did it break it out at all into awareness and was there? Anything that went to, have you sought resources yes. and not found them, or do you just not know that they're there? How did, was there anything telling you? About <coughs> we asked about <coughs> awareness of the resources and have they accessed the resources. Now, what I'm hearing in the last, go ahead. I'm asking for the ones who weren't aware, was there a question? So that's, yes, awareness of it, and then if you're aware of it, are you using it? Yes. If you are if you were on the not aware side, is, is there it. anything that went to, have you asked or, or maybe it goes back to the question that you were asking. Do you feel this is a place to even ask if there's a resource? Because that may get too hard to work Yeah, in our initial uh, survey, we did not get at that. So for the people who would answer no to that, we didn't take them to a different okay. sub-question in this particular survey. Yeah, and, and you know, I, we thought that maybe we would be standing here saying, you know, this is a long survey, you know, and that's a limitation of this study. But, you know, we had a pretty good response rate. No, that's not you know, we had a, so I'm glad that I'm not standing here saying, you know, that it was a limitation of the study. And I think it's a testament to the fact that students wanted to talk about this. You know, having eight and a half single space pages of content for that challenge question, that was, we were just sitting there like, what are, we gotta go line, we gotta label these lines and we literally and where does this one stop? I mean we are really into this, so we're gonna do it justice. Mark. Um, first of all, I feel like I'm watching a really good movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I have to step that. out of that role to uh, <laughs> get my questions together here. Um, so all that is a compliment to you all and the hard work that you put in on this extremely important area. Um, one of the things that seemed to resonate from the types of questions and responses that you got was kind of a pushback against some of the conventional wisdom and the research about a success model yes. and the, the taboo of um, discussing remedial, <laughs> using terms like remedial or students need help and things like that. Whereas the students look at it from the standpoint of, I'm drowning in here. I don't know what to do. The, um, uh, even as, as um, we talk about the barriers to seeking help 
half the students suggested they knew help was available. Right. Right. But then you have to deal with the notion that, that we're seeing in our program anecdotally of, okay, now I have to reveal that I need mm -hmm. help. Even though the professor's grading my paper, there's a detachment from, yes. okay, now I have to go to him and say, I'm the one that got the 14 out of 100. Right. Now what do I do? Even inside the classroom where a professor talks about, uh, as the professor is there to, to cover content and maybe give some hints about what successful students do, there's still, I suggest, a gap between what a successful student does who knows how to do that and me, who I'm walking in hearing you talk about, well, you know, I, I spend uh, uh, three hours a night studying. And I'm finished reading the chapter in an hour, so what, do I, what am I supposed to do now? And that's a question I'm not going to ask in class as a student when I'm feeling like I'm drowning. And then that leads back into what I hear the, the respondents saying, my family can't help me. Those are the people I'm comfortable with. Those are the people I've been asking for help and have gotten up bar past that barrier yeah. of um, feeling like I'm stigmatized and asking for help. But they can't help me now. Help's available but I'm not accessing it. I hear, I saw a flyer for the Academic Success Center. How do I go in and say, help? Right. Could be a fair. Yes, and in the content, we did not see as much, um, you know, of the conversation being about the students' relationships with their advisors as much as we did about peer-to-peer -peer relationships and their relationships with faculty in the classroom. And so that was very interesting. I am very much looking forward to focus groups where I can actually begin to understand that because some of the, the information that I've learned even you know in my own teaching is that oftentimes there are you know cultural and social kind of barriers where you know students will use that to you know avoid well they dismissed me or they were they had their back turned to me when I went to financial aid and I'm not calling out any particular area I'm just giving examples or uh, you know they they said things in a certain way. I mean, speech patterns and the way that people talk to other people, their nonverbal interactions, all of these things are very important to students culturally to make me feel like you're somebody that I can talk to. And so these are some things that you know right now at least we don't know that that is an issue. But I would love to get into some of these focus groups where we can take some of these bigger themes and really begin to kind of talk about them and translate them uh, in their everyday experiences. But, you know, this is this is a start. I'm looking around for other questions before I have my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, Danielle, they may be aware of these resources but don't really think that they could help them? Like, you know, there's an academic success center, but they might be struggling, but what are they going to do for me? Not really understanding. Um, I, because I, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, okay, we do orientation, we do advising, we, you know, and I know we talk about these things, but maybe they're not registering because they don't think these things will help. You know, I don't know, Vicki, and I, I, with the questions that we've done so far, I can't conclude on that. You know, one of the things that I do wonder about is whether, and this is specifically for first gens, because I, I have to kind of understand them in a different type of way because they're the ones who told me the most about the challenges that they've had and about their college experience. And I mean, some of these people, it was like paragraph, you know, like there were several lines where we had to say, no, this is still this person talking, where they were just venting about these kinds of experiences. And one of the, the things was, you know, one gave us an example where I know that, you know, uh, I, because I've looked into it but the person didn't tell me that this was available to me. And it was something that dealt with uh, a benefit that they would have gotten from being a veteran or a part of some, you know, whatever their identity was, but it wasn't told to them. And they said that when they went on the website that it wasn't clear that this was available to me, but they did some research, and because of that came back to the university to say, now I need you to tell me about this. So that's how they discovered it in that interaction. So. We do have evidence, and I mean, I could give you other accounts of students who have accessed, you know, some of the areas within the university, uh, but I don't see 
yet how that is feeding back into them being more successful or better able to matriculate through their experience. Uh, if I may speak on it as well. Yeah. I think utilizing these resources for myself in particular, it comes from that community sense. Because I knew about these things, but until I got to a certain point, I never took advantage <laughs> because I didn't really believe in it until I had That's where I'm there. getting at, is that, you know, we talk about it, but yeah. students like you say, well, I don't think it's going to be able to help me. Yeah, and I think what really made me go to it is, um, well, one, I got a little bit older, and two, my friends who actually use these resources came back to me and told me it would actually help me. Okay. So I think it helped me to believe that it would help. Mm -hmm. Please. I just wanted to make a quick comment on what you were saying. I had an issue where I went to the academic success center, and I didn't really know much about it beforehand. Yeah. So then when I went to them and I had an issue, they told me that um, I, had, I had to let them know at the beginning of the semester, beginning of the course, which I knew nothing about. So like it's like more like educate people that you actually have to say to them beforehand. Because I didn't think I was going to have the issue with anything like that. University at the time is very helpful. Yeah, I think one of the things that <coughs> at least I'm putting a pen in is the issue of voice and kind of do I know I have one and when is it appropriate to use it? Because we're seeing overwhelmingly that kind of like students are told something and they let it, that's it. And so we don't know that we can go further or this is unacceptable to me or no, excuse me, you've answered one question, but I have another one here. And so I'm putting a pin in that right now. It's in the parking lot. It's this issue of student voice and kind of embracing that and understanding how to use voice. You know, I also, in my mind, I'm thinking that there has to be a way. I, you know, I, your question is kind of haunting me a little bit, Vicki, because Maybe we do need to, you know, there's another step there in making the connection between, you know, the students and the resources and this issue of do I know that it's here and have I accessed it, but maybe that's more relational as well, you know, in terms of me fitting into these resources, that there's a relational aspect that we're not yet getting at. Well, I know from research is that there might be like supplemental instruction, but on Sometimes if you put that supplemental instruction <coughs> next door to the class that needs it, you're going to get more use out of it than if they have to actually go over at a separate time to a building or whatever. You know, so I don't know. I mean, we maybe have to get it closer somehow yeah. to make the connection. Go ahead. I had a, it's more of a comment, I think. But first of all, thank you for asking the question. Because I've worked here in student services for 14 years, and I think relating to what you're talking about, I was coming at a lot of this from more of that institutional, yep. because of where I work and yep. whatever. I know. I know. Um, but also on the other hand, being a participant at every orientation for the last 10 years and it, just kind of seeing it in person. So Vicki, to kind of touch on what you're saying, perhaps we do tell students about resources and support and what's available, but maybe we're not even telling them in the right way. And if we're only telling them that one time or we're it's the same <laughs> message over and over, you know, I mean, this is, it's, I'm just kind of sitting here going, oh, it's, right? <laughs> so it's important and to keep talking about it. And I'm fascinated by this and this is awesome. So. You know, one of the models that I'm starting to read about is universities that are literally bringing the resources to the students. Mm -hmm. And so the model is, you know, that we have a menu of resources that are available to you here on campus and we're going to bring them to a cohort. So I might bring the resources to a learning community or one of the things that I would love is a residential learning community where maybe for first gens they're coming here, they're living you know, together on campus with exposure to faculty who may also be residential uh, for those weeks or whatever the period might be and we're literally opening up the book to them. You know that we're saying welcome to the university, right? Yeah. That we want you here and we want to enhance your experience here and now let's open up the big book and share the knowledge with you. Because, you know, the, the thing that we're seeing is that they don't feel like that aspect has happened. Right. That I have to find my way and I'm not prepared to find my way. I don't know what I'm looking for. 
And to be fair, some of that that you just mentioned is actually happening in some of our learning communities. That's what I've heard. But it's yeah. on such a small yeah. scale. It's 10 students. It's 10 that. students. It's 20 students. It's 30 students at a time. Yeah. Not the 28,000 that need it. Yeah. Gotcha. Listen to some of your comments. I think we all kind of underestimate the stereotype image that first generation and you are uh, underrepresented minority students have and that we think we tend to think that it doesn't bother them but it does yes. and and many of them are absolutely the stereotype of them asking for help or admitting that they don't know things are not understanding the system or the university weighs much heavier on them than some, and a student that is from a background whose family has been to university and things like that. And we completely underestimate it because the student will sit there and petrified and never say anything. Yes. Because everybody's going to think that I'm dumb. That I don't belong. And I don't yep. belong. Yes. And yes. you have to understand, and I think people ignore it because many <laughs> faculty are not from those backgrounds, so they don't appreciate that threat. Yes, to all of it. <laughs> I think the one limitation of all of this is that we have focused on undergraduate students. And, you know, even what you just said, I see that. I teach uh, primarily in our graduate program, and it's the same thing. I see the same thing, you know, with students who will not make a move because they felt like I had two last semester. I didn't think it mattered. I didn't think I could. And, you know, I'm saying you're a graduate student. But you cannot just conclude that because they're a graduate student, they have a different level of how to get how I got here and how to do this than an undergraduate student does. Yeah, Mark. Well, it made me think about the comparison of the student's most recent experience being high school yeah. uh, versus college and the relationship between a teacher and high school and a professor in college. Mm -hmm. the teacher sees you every day. Yeah. By the end of the second week, they know who you are by face and your name. And then they continue to get to know how you work in their class and the quality of your work associated with your face. Yeah. And then they, uh, by virtue of your demeanor in the classroom, they identify buttons that they can press to motivate you, chastise you when appropriate, and celebrate you when you're doing right things or approximating those things, etc. Yeah. And that student carries that knowledge of the person that stands up in front of the classroom to college. And that first gen student with few other people that they trust yeah. to contribute to that knowledge, they're shocked. And it, it results in, um, this person doesn't like me. They're saying things that the professor may be appropriately talking about subject matter, but they may internalize it and personalize it. They're talking about <coughs> because I'm the only black student in the classroom, or I'm the only LGBT uh, student in the classroom, etc. And that gap widens as opposed to uh, reduces, perhaps. Uh, at least some of the stories that students tell me about resonate with that. I don't know how and to I don't know that we know how to fix that, yes. because that's on our end. Yeah, and, and I don't, when I look in the literature, it's almost like there's, there's a multiple levels of this. You know, that there is a cultural level of this that, you know, is a sense-making mechanism. And then there is this kind of other level, you know, about what I can put down here that you need to do, the things that you need to do to be more successful. You know, and when we were given our testimonies with one another, there were some of us who felt like, well, I felt like I was prepared for this. And if I went to a particular department and they told me this, I just knew I could do this. And then there were others in our group who said, oh, I, I, that wouldn't have even occurred to me. That would have been it for me. You know, I would not have accessed that information because I was not prepared to deal with that. So, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to tread lightly and, and respect every voice that, you know, has made an attempt to fill out this survey. I'm trying to figure out a way to respect every voice. Yeah. And it is not always an easy task because I don't want to just group everybody and say this is who they are. Yeah, Mom, you'll have the last one because I think we're over. Dr. Edwards is being generous with us. Oh, okay. Well, you answered one question because I don't think 
your research really uh, involved the older student? Well, but then you said something. The undergraduate student here is, you know, the age, <laughs> you know, they can be an older student. Oh, okay. And we did take age uh, as a demographic, but the comment that I had made was about our graduate students. And a lot of times our graduate students could be ones who they got an undergrad and they went right on to get a master's degree uh, or, you know, the doctoral degree, or they have come back, you know, there may be a gap. So when we talk about age here at the university, it's not a traditional college student by no means. I mean, at the undergraduate level or even the graduate level, that we definitely can't take for granted. Because I think when you get to college, everybody has this sense of kind of like, I'm okay, you're okay. And you don't want to, if somebody is struggling, they may hesitate to say that they are. Because I know it took me several years to, to get to a bachelor's degree. Yeah. And when I got to the university, if it's something I didn't know, I hesitated to even ask or to, you know, say, well, I should know. I felt like I should know should this. Know it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I mean, it, things had to really get bad until before I went, I said, okay, I, I gotta ask somebody. But I hesitated because I thought, you're in college. Okay, you should know, it. You should know this, you're in college, or you know, if you couldn't do this, you wouldn't be here. So I must be able to do this. Yeah, I think it but goes back to- along the way. I think it goes back to sharing it with them. There has to be some model or approach where we're taking some of these resources to the students and, you know, Amy, thank you for your comment about we're doing this on a small scale because I have started hearing rumblings about, you know, that we're doing this with our learning communities. But, you know, I often wonder if there's a way for those of us who believe in this to kind of posse up and think about ways that we might, you know, go get some grant money or do something to be able to give more of our students this kind of an experience. Because when I see uh, the, read it on the websites and look at the articles where universities are doing this with much success, I'm saying, hmm, we need to get some of that up in here. I know, I know. Money. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you.